and thank you so much for um, allowing me to be in your living rooms today. I wanted to talk about what kind of grains to include in your diet. And the reason why I wanted to include it, um, this kind of lecture, of course, Jamie was my inspiration for this, but also so many people wanna go on this low carb diet. Um, so we have to be very choosy on which carbohydrates and which grains we wanna bring into our diet. So you might as well get bang for your buck and choose the best ones since we need to be so choosy. So of course, we're gonna talk about what is whole grain because as a nutritionist and you know doctors, we're always promoting whole grain over regular. <laughs> so I wanna tell you what the difference is and what to spot for when you're shopping for grains. I'm gonna talk about the benefits of eating grains. When you leave grains out of your diet, you're actually creating this void of a really good food that can help your health. And remember, you know, when you look at foods and choose foods, try do the best you can because what we put into our body, into our temple is actually going to either confer health or, or lead to ill health. Um, and for some of these grains, I'll talk about some cooking and recipe tips because I think what stops people from cooking or buying some of these fancy grains is that they just don't know how to cook them. So first, what is a whole grain? Well, when you look at a kernel, whether it's a wheat kernel, a barley kernel, a corn kernel, they're, all, they're gonna contain three layers. They have the outer bran, which we call complex carbohydrates have the bran. And the bran is so important because it has fiber, it has the B vitamins, it has the texture. Um, it, it just, you know, it's yummy. And then you've got the endosperm, which is the inner portion of the kernel, which is mostly the starch. And then you have this little tiny section called the germ. And the germ is interesting because that's where the actual plant can, can grow from the germ. And the germ is so important too because it's packed with more vitamins and it also has the good fats, uh, like the, the linoleic acids, it has vitamin E. So it's really good for us. So when we refer to something that's 100% whole grain, that means you're eating a product that has all three layers the brand, the endosperm, and the germ. If you get something white or refined, they've ripped it apart. They've taken the bran out, they've taken the germ out, and all you're ending up with is the starch. And then what's so ridiculous is that the food industry will put in the vitamins. It's called um, enriching or fortifying. So you might have like a cereal like cornflakes, which you know, might be tasty, but it has really no nutritional value. So the food industry has to put the vitamins back into the cereal that they ripped away, which you know just doesn't seem to make sense. So when you look at your health and grains, you gotta look at certain things. And the number one thing is fiber. Dietary fiber is so healthy for us in so many different ways. Um, we Americans don't eat very much fiber according to the dietary recommendations. We're supposed to be eating, if you're a man, between 30 to 38 grams a day. And if you're a lady, between 25 to 28 grams of fiber a day. But the average American only eats about 14 grams of fiber a day. And that's not good because what does fiber do? Well, you've got two types of fiber. You've got soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. And the soluble fiber is, just to give you an example, just say you have, um, okay, so you have a whole grain and you've got the starchy part and you have the bran part and you have the germ part. The bran on the outside would be an insoluble fiber. That means that it resists digestion in the intestines. Now, why is that good? Well, for a couple of reasons. Number one, you exercise your intestines. Now, remember your organs are muscles too. <laughs> so you've got to exercise them. So if you're eating insoluble fiber, it exercises the intestines to keep them functioning well. It also helps to um, bulk up stool so you can eliminate it easily. But not only that, dietary fiber can also improve your cholesterol. It can also improve your um, blood sugar. So if you do have conditions like high blood pressure or um, diabetes or pre-diabetes, increasing your fiber can actually help to decrease those parameters and help you make uh, help you feel better. Also, fiber helps you to feel full because it's an indigestible product. Your stomach kind of holds on to it a little bit and then you feel that bulk in your stomach. And if you feel full, hopefully that signals us to stop eating. <laughs> Unfortunately, I know with myself, I keep eating anyway, which I shouldn't. The other thing is the whole grains also contain a bunch of vitamins. 
So we've got the B vitamins, especially vitamin B1, B2, B3, B9. So I wanted to just talk about those for a second. Vitamin B1, which is called thiamine, is such an amazing vitamin. And what it does is it participates in carbohydrate metabolism. And it, it's very rare that you'll find a deficiency of thiamine in the United States, unless you have um, surgery or issues like alcoholism and things like that. You rarely find a deficiency, but it's very good for our brain. It's very good for metabolism. Um, so that's another good reason to have whole grains. Riboflavin, believe it or not, riboflavin is good for our skin. It's also good for that, that uh, metabolic pathway called the Krebs cycle. So again, it's involved in metabolism. Niacin, well, if there are any cardiologists out there, cardiologists love niacin because it, it actually helps the heart. So niacin is also a very good B vitamin. Folic acid or folate, amazing vitamin. Um, not only does it prevent anemia, but it also helps your heart because it helps to lower something called homocysteine, which is a natural byproduct of metabolism. And if it gets built up in your bloodstream, it's not good for your heart. Then you've got vitamin E, which we know is an antioxidant. It's a fat soluble vitamin. It's, it prevents hemolytic anemia. Um, it helps to prevent cancer. It's, it's, a, it's an amazing vitamin. You've got iron. Iron is very important, not just for our blood, but also for our Krebs cycle. So it's also involved with metabolism as well. Magnesium is an electrolyte, which is very good for our blood pressure to regulate. Selenium is an antioxidant that helps to prevent cancer and things like that. So again, that when you look at the vitamins and minerals that are found in whole grains, they're just power packed with things. And then last but not least, they're good. They have the good fats, the good fatty acids, the same things that you might find similarly in nuts, like the linoleic acids and linolenic acids. So I think one of the biggest challenges of the American diet, though, is that we eat too many carbohydrates and we're not eating the right ones. Remember, carbohydrates are the greatest food group. So when you're looking at grains, we have so many different choices from the pastas and the rices and the breads and the crackers. I mean, there's so many things. So we really want to try to focus and hone in on what's called the complex carbohydrates because you'll know they'll have the fiber in the bran. Um, but how much should we eat? So I just created this chart. This, how much you eat of a starch or a carbohydrate or a grain actually depends on how many calories you eat and how much exercise you do. So this, is just, this, this isn't set in stone, this chart. It just gives you a nice template, but I'll give you an example. So just say I follow a 1200 calorie diet, but I do a lot of high intensity aerobics or I go swimming or cycling, then I might wanna be on that high end of that starch intake, you know, five servings, um, that would be good. If I decided on a certain day that eh, I'm not gonna do any exercise today, I'm just gonna be a couch potato, then I might actually decrease that five servings to three servings. So, you know, serving sizes, you should play around with them. And the only way to really play around with your serving size is you need to know how much you're eating, which means you need to track yourself. And that's what most people don't do. Um, they think they know what they're eating or they have this routine of eating the same thing, maybe for breakfast or lunch, but then they kind of blow it with the snacks. So the more that you can self-track yourself, the better it is. So now you might be saying, well, okay, so Lil, this says 1200 calorie diet, I should have five servings, but how big is the serving size? Well, that's a good question. The serving size depends on what product it is. So if you have a whole grain piece of toast, one slice is about one ounce. Now what's tricky about the food industry is that it's very difficult to find a slice of bread that's only one ounce. Most of the sizes are about one and a half ounces. So you're already getting, you know, a serving and a half. And I think that's what's contributed to some of our overweight issues. Not that I'm saying that you have it, but this is the population I deal with. People want to lose weight. And that's because I think they're eating more even by accident. So that's why I read your food labels. You're not just looking at the ingredients, but you're also looking at the serving size. Then when you look at the grains, whether it's rice, pasta, couscous, things like that, um, half a cup would be equal to one serving size. Okay, so just to give you an example, if I, just to go back again, if I was doing five servings of a, of a starch or a complex carbohydrate, that's what, two and a half, right? Two and a half servings. 
think about it. If I'm having half a cup, if I'm having oatmeal for breakfast and then I'm having a sandwich for lunch and then my Italian husband wants pasta, you know, I'm probably going to overdo that starch serving. So that's why we tend to overdo our complex carbohydrates or our starches. This also gives you some other examples. Um, a lot of my clients like crackers. I like crackers too. And there's so many amazing whole grain crackers out there now. Um, but you really have to watch the serving size. Five crackers is about the serving size. Um, so when I say five, that would be about the size of, oh, let's see if I can just give you an example. So I have my cell phone here. I don't know if you can see my cell phone. Probably just this little piece right here. That would be one serving. Okay, so I can have five of those. But we know crackers are almost addicting. They're almost like chips. So you can tend to overeat crackers. So be careful, take out your serving size and then you'll know that's what you're gonna eat. Now, popcorn is cool. I like popcorn. Um, of course, try not to put all the butter and salt on it, but popcorn or corn is a whole grain. So three cups of air popped popcorn is actually one serving size. So that's why that's one of the most favored, you know, snack items for people that are trying to lose weight, because it is a whole grain. And it looks like you're eating a lot because you get three cups. And then I do have a lot of my clients that like to eat like tortillas and wraps and things like that. Um, some of the wraps are huge. So you have to make sure the diameter is only about six inches. So get the smaller ones. But this just gives you an idea of the portion sizes that we should be eating. The other thing that you wanna look for is read the ingredient list because it's very tricky. Everything on the outside, of course, looks pretty and it's marketing and you know, you, you see a pretty package and you're, you're looking at it and saying, oh, that must be a good thing for my health. And then you start reading the ingredient list and it's junk. So when you see anything that says enriched flour, that means that it is a refined product where they've stripped away all the good stuff and then they start adding stuff. <laughs> and you can even see it from this ingredient list. So it's enriched flour, you know, they've ripped off everything. And then here they're adding riboflavin, folic acid. So they're actually adding the vitamins back in, which is ridiculous. And then um, here you want to look for something that says whole okay, or 100%. If it just said wheat flour by itself, that's not necessarily whole grain. Um, you got to make sure that the word whole or 100% is in front of it. The other thing too is that the um, industry has created these labels too to help us identify if something is whole grain, 100%. So if you can see this little insignia on your product, then you know you're getting the whole grain. There are some gluten-free whole grains out there, and I'm not going to dwell too much on gluten-free, but gluten-free, gluten is actually a protein found in certain grain products. And unfortunately, gluten has been implicated in um, celiac disease, um, allergies, uh, food sensitivities. So a lot of people want to eat grains that don't have the gluten, and then they become less symptomatic. Um, so these are just some that are gluten-free, like amaranth, which I'm going to talk about today, brown rice, corn, teff, sour gum, buckwheat, which I'm going to talk about, millet I talk about, quinoa, which is actually a grass, wild rice. And I put oats with these asterisks because not all oats are gluten-free depending upon where they're processed. So if you really are being strict with the gluten, you have to make sure the package will say gluten-free. So that's why I put that one up there. Now, another um, great thing, too, are something called sprouted grains. So what exactly does that mean? Well, remember when I showed you the three parts, you got that, you know, bran and you got the germ and you got the um, starch. Well, that little section called the germ is actually where you can actually sprout and grow your grain. So what the food industry does is actually um, grow or start to sprout the grain. And you might be thinking, well, doesn't that take away the nutrients? Actually, what it does is it power packs the nutrient. Um, it almost brings that grain to life. And when you're eating it, you're eating the life of that grain. It's pretty neat. Um, and when you look at, I just bolded this because I cut and pasted it from this uh, website. These are just some um, research studies that show what can sprouting of a grain do? 
Well, sprouting amaranth can increase the amount of antioxidants. It can increase the fiber in the brown rice, uh, the antioxidant activity in the millet. It can actually reduce glycemic index. It can actually increase some of the absorption of folate, which we had mentioned. Um, it decreases blood pressure, et cetera. So there are health benefits associated with buying products that are sprouted. So there aren't so many of them on the market. You just have to kind of take a look at the package. I know the Ezekiel breads have been around a long time. So that's the most common one that, that my patients and clients eat. But there are, all, there are also even sprouted pasta. And I saw this actually in Publix. I was really shocked and happy about that. So again, it's just another um, suggestion. If you're going to get bang for your buck and you decide, well, I wanna have my bread to have a sandwich, okay, maybe do a whole grain sprouted bread. So I didn't really wanna talk about brown rice and quinoa and whole wheat and oatmeal. We already know about all that. We already know that quinoa is a superfood. We already know. So I wanted to talk about other grains that um, might be a little bit more ancient or a little bit more um, un, not as common for you to eat, but I want you to try to eat them. So the first one is amaranth. And the first time I ever had amaranth, it was the neatest thing. It was actually a flea market. And there was um, a person that um, came from Peru and she had this bag and it almost looked like popcorn, but little tiny kernels. And she was selling it. You could eat it as like a cereal or you can eat it right out of the bag. I'm like, what is that? She goes, that's popped amaranth. And it was so neat and it tasted so good. It was just, you know, that's a nice alternative to popcorn, right? And it's such a pretty plant. Look at it. It's just beautiful. And what they do is they um, actually dry these little grains so when you look at the health benefits, um, amaranth has been shown to preserve lean body mass. And that is so important for us for our health because certainly as we get older, we tend to lose our muscle. Um, so this is a really great way to help preserve our muscle. And for those of us that do more of a plant-based diet because you wanna get rid of some of the animal proteins, having amaranth is a really great addition. It also helps with digestive health because it is high in fiber. And again, anything that's high in fiber is going to be good for your heart. <laughs> and it's also anti-cancer. It's also anti-inflammatory. And some of the vitamins and minerals in it are good for bone health. Um, this was kind of neat. I thought this was, was kind of nice. The um, amaranth comes from the Greek word amaranthos, which means one that does not wither. <laughs> I like that. That means I'm going to be, it's a superfood and I'm going to stay alive a long time and I'm not going to wither. I like that. Um, it is the native crop of Peru, which was nice. It's gluten-free. It's high in the minerals like calcium and that's why it's very good for our bones. It also has good iron as well, which is nice. So remember, if you want to get rid of some of the animal products, but still you need your calcium and your iron, this is a good choice. It also has phosphorus and phosphorus is also very good for our bones. What's nice about amaranth is that it's also high in protein. So one cup of amaranth gives us about 28 grams of protein. And just to make a comparison, if you had a three ounce piece of chicken breast, that gives you about 24 grams of protein. Okay, so, you know, that's pretty good. The other thing I liked is that it's actually high in lysine, which is a branch chain amino acid, which is really good to preserve that lean body mass. It's the only grain product that contains vitamin C. I love that. And vitamin C is a vitamin that we do not make as a human being. So we can only get it from our food. So I think this is really, really great to have vitamin C from a grain. I just love that. It's high in fiber, like we mentioned. It's also high in the good fat called linoleic acid. Uh, linoleic acid is one of the good fats that's good for our heart. It's good for our nerve tissue. It's good for our brain. And it's also high in manganese. Manganese is an electrolyte. It's not an electrolyte. It's a mineral that's actually good for um, different enzymatic processes in our body. This is just showing you a comparison. So brown rice, white rice, and amaranth. So when you look at the calories per serving, 100 grams, which is, um, this one is about a cup. It's only got 50 calories in a cup. That's awesome. And when you look at the amount of um, 
nutrients like this is like nothing there's like zero down the line here we've got it's got a little bit of the fat remember 2.5 grams but it's the good fat it's really got good um, potassium which is good for your heart right that's an electrolyte it has a little bit of sodium um, it's got some carbohydrate but it's good with fiber it doesn't have any sugar and, and this one cup um, is about seven grams of protein so you know when you do the comparison I think it's a pretty good product. And then look at this down here, 2% vitamin E. It's got iron. It's got that magnesium. It's got some folate. So it's a pretty healthy grain. So how do you cook this thing? Well, I have a rice cooker and I stick everything in the rice cooker. Because I'm lazy. I can't sit there all day and you know stir things. So I stick it in a rice cooker. And what I do is I add about two to three cups of water per one cup of amaranth. So that's how I cook it. And it gets nice and steamy and fluffy. And it's a really great side dish. Um, it doesn't have a very strong flavor, which is nice. So that, that way you can pair it with a lot of your different foods. Um, you can also pop it. Um, I've, I attempted that once. Uh, I burned it, unfortunately. Um, but I'm going to try again. Um, usually the way I do popcorn is I get the kernels and I pop it myself. So I put a little bit of oil in a pan, get it really hot, put the kernels, and then they start to pop. Um, but I think I had the temperature too high and it burnt. Um, the other thing you can do is mix it with other grains. You know, maybe you like white rice. Okay, well, maybe you can just power pack your white rice by mixing the two. And then you can also use it as a breading as well, which is kind of nice. And this is just a picture to show you. This is the little tiny seed. And then when it pops, it looks like that. So it's really tiny. You know, this is just a lentil to compare the different size. And this just shows you a website that if you're really interested in making different dishes, this has a, this is a nice website for that. My second most favorite grain is called farro. It almost looks like barley, but it's not barley. Um, it's definitely a heart healthy grain, but it's, it's a very power packed grain. It's great. It helps to prevent anemia because it has iron, but it also has the B vitamins, the B1 and the B12 and the folic acid. It boosts immunity. And boy, oh boy, do we need to boost our immunity these days with this COVID. Um, and I'd rather you get your zinc from food because now now what I'm facing as a nutritionist, I have a lot of my patients and clients, they're taking a lot of over-the-counter supplements like zinc, and their zinc levels are going too high, which can actually be dangerous because it interferes with the iron absorption. Rarely will you find your zinc or your minerals or your vitamins go too high from food. So this way, eat, eat the farro to get the zinc. Magnesium, again, for the heart. It has anti-inflammatories in the form of what we call lignins. It also has antioxidants. And these are just the fancy names for all those antioxidants it contains. So polyphenols, carotenoids, phytosteroids, and of course, selenium. It has high fiber. Um, because of that high fiber, it helps to bring down that blood sugar. Um, it's good for the heart. It's, of course, a source of energy because it, it is that complex carbohydrate. It also preserves the lean body mass. It's anti-cancerous. You'll see a lot of these recipes in Middle Eastern and Mediterranean diets. Farro is actually an Italian word for ancient wheat grain. So it is a form of wheat. Um, so it is not gluten free. Um, this is the one that you're going to be most familiar with. It's called spelt. So you can see that in the store. So sometimes it might not be called farro, it might be called spelt. And just to give you a comparative, so half a cup of cooked is got about 150 calories, which is about right. Um, 34 grams of carbohydrate, but eight grams is fiber. It does have some protein, it's low in sugar. It has the niacin, the magnesium, the iron, the zinc. And what's really neat about farro is that it comes in different forms. Believe it or not, it comes in this whole grain where you're gonna get all of it. You'll get the outer bran, you'll get the germ, you'll get the starch, but then you can also get this pearled and pearled means that it actually strips away the outer bran. So you'll, you're still gonna get the germ, um, but if you can try to get this one, the one that's not pearled. Although the benefit of pearled is that it cooks a lot easier. Um, it also comes in different sizes, kind of like rice. You know, you've got the long grain rice and the short grain rice. So um, I like both. <laughs> I think the best way to cook farro is if you can soak it overnight because that'll expedite the cooking process. I still use my rice cooker for this. Um, 
this pearled, pearled farro, that cooks really quick. So my rice cooker goes off really quick, only about 15 to 20 minutes, but the whole grain, it's usually gonna take a little bit longer. These are just uh, another website if you wanna look for different recipes. But again, the way I make it is I cook everything in my rice cooker and then I'll make a salad out of it or I'll put it in my salad or I'll put it in my soup or sometimes I'll just make it as a side dish. So I'll put some cut vegetables in it or I put nuts in it, you know, put, um, um, you know, make it Mediterranean. So I might put some raisins in it. It has a nuttier flavor. Um, that's what I like about it. And I really do enjoy this also for breakfast. So instead of oatmeal, I make farro and then I'll put a little bit of protein shake in it and maybe a little bit of honey or a little bit of um, um, syrup. So it's actually a, a nice breakfast food too. Now this one's called frika. And the first time I ever had frika, I was actually in Qatar. And um, it is an ancient grain. It's, it's mostly used in the Mediterranean and the Middle East again. And this is what it looks like. It's also called farric, but I usually hear it as frika. It's actually a sun-dried wheat. So it is a whole grain. It's a wheat, but it's sun-dried. And that's why it gives it that roasty kind of nutty kind of flavor, which is nice. And this one, though, is gluten-free. Um, it's been touted to help with weight loss. I think they all say that though. And just, just as an aside to that, if you eat a bunch of frika and farro, it's going to contribute to weight. You still have to keep it under control in terms of the portion. It's going to control the blood sugar because of the high fiber. It's got a lot of antioxidants in it. It does relieve constipation, but of course that's because of the fiber. It helps bone health, heart health, and it also helps the lean body mass. And it contains something called glutamine, which is a different amino acid, which is really good for strength and endurance. Glutamine is also good good for gut health as well. So if you just had surgery on your gut, like just say you had a, a gallbladder removal or appendicitis and you had that removed, having some Frico will actually help improve the health of your gut. So I just wanted to show you the comparative. Again, this is only half a cup, so it's one serving, which is so nice. It's still pretty low in calories, 139 calories. But look at this, this I love. Total carbohydrate is really only 23 grams, which isn't much when you look at, you know, compare it to farro and rice. But look at this dietary fiber, it's 10 grams. And I didn't mention this before, but when you've got a high dietary fiber, what you do, and high means anything above five, that, that's considered high fiber. You actually subtract the fiber from the total carbohydrate and that gives you the net carbs. So if you've ever seen that terminology, total carb, net carb, net carb would be how much carbohydrate actually goes through the digestive process. So when you look at this product, I subtract 10 from 23. That means the net carbs are only 13 grams. That's amazing. So if you have half a cup of a whole grain and only get 13 grams of carb, that can definitely fit in a low carb diet. And look at this, the protein, again, beautiful amount of protein. And this part I love too, it is very high in potassium. And what exactly does potassium do? It's an electrolyte. So it interchanges between sodium and potassium. That's, that, you know, it's good for muscle contraction and heart contraction, um, and it helps with blood pressure. So it's really high in potassium. It's got the zinc, I love that. And 31 milligrams of zinc, for people that are on um, have COVID prevention, a lot of doctors are recommending that people take between 30 to 50 milligrams of zinc a day from a supplement. Well, hey, I'd rather you have Frica instead. So do Frica for your zinc. It's got some calcium, which is nice, half a cup, especially for those of us that don't do a lot of dairy products or drink milk. We have to find calcium from other sources um, just because we need so much calcium in our diet. We need like 1,000 to 1,200 milligrams. It, got, it has good iron. And again, it has all of these um, lutein and zeaxanthin. These are good for our eyes. It helps to prevent that macular degeneration. So it does have antioxidants, but even more specifically for your eye health. So I love Frika. So how do you buy it? You can buy it either whole grain or cracked. And cracked just means that they, they crack it. They literally crack it. And that helps to reduce some of the cooking time, which is nice. 
Um, you might want to add a little bit more water. Um, that's what I do. So I do like a two to one ratio. So about two and a half cups. Um, but again, my rice cooker does the magic. And it looks like this. It almost looks like a couscous or a quinoa. And again, it has that nutty kind of smoky flavor. It's really, really yummy. And I just wanted to give you the comparison between farro, because that's my other favorite one, and the frica. So it does have a little more calories, but again, it's so power packed with the fiber. Now, the other grain I wanted to pay attention to is buckwheat. Now, buckwheat is actually not a whole grain per se. It's actually a fruit seed <laughs> that's related to rhubarb and sorrel. <laughs> and buckwheat is sold either unroasted or roasted. Um, but if you get roasted buckwheat, it's also referred to as kasha. And buckwheat is often served as either a rice alternative or porridge or an oatmeal alternative. It is gluten-free. Um, it's native to Northern Europe as well as Asia. And it's a really great nutritional profile again. Remember, I wanna get bang for my buck with these grains. So it's got the manganese, it has the folate, it has the potassium, but look at this, it has copper. And copper is another mineral that's very good for our blood to prevent anemia. It's got magnesium, it has dietary fiber, it has the phosphorus. And this one's neat, it's got two flavonoids called rutin and quercetin, and that, those are anti-cancer. And it also has a good source of that lutein and zeaxanthin, which again is good for the eyes to prevent the macular degeneration. And this is neat, it's very high quality protein because it contains all eight essential amino acids. And again, if you're getting more of a plant-based diet, that's what you wanna capture something that's high protein, but good quality protein. Um, usually what I do with the buckwheat or most of the grains that I get I, when I put it in my rice cooker, I rinse it just because sometimes you'll get little sands or little bits of rocks and stuff. So always make sure you rinse everything just to make sure it's clean. And then this I do two parts again, two parts water. I always add a little extra water. Um, maybe it's just my rice cooker because I don't like things too dry, um, adding a little extra water, but you play around with that. Um, the other thing that you can find is you can find this in a flour form and it's really nice. So instead of making your pancakes from like white flour, do buckwheat flour. Um, there are a lot of pasta noodles that are made out of buckwheat, especially in the Asian markets. We Asians love buckwheat. Um, so I think this is a, is a really nice alternative. Make, you know, breads, buckwheat breads. Um, you can actually add the buckwheat to different soups and stews, which is nice. Use it as a side dish. So this is another nice um, website to go to. Now I wanted to talk about barley. Barley seems, you know, the only thing that I know people eat barley is like the barley soup, <laughs> but you can do barley in so many other ways. Barley is a whole grain. Um, when you sprout barley, it's actually high in a um, simple sugar called maltose actually. And maltose is, uh, is what we use to make malt or even beer. Um, so when it's fermented, um, it is an ingredient in alcoholic beverages. It did orig originate in Ethiopia and Southeast Asia. Um, they were the first to make wine out of it, which is nice, uh, Babylonia. Um, barley water, which I'm gonna introduce to you in a second, has been actually used for a lot of medicinal purposes. And we Asians drink barley water almost like a tea. So I'm gonna show you, show you that in a minute. This is kind of neat. Barley played an important role in ancient Greek culture as a staple bread making grain, as well as an important food for athletes. That's kind of nice. Ancient Roman athletes honored barley for the strength it gave them. And barley was honored by China as a symbol of virility. That's always fun. So this is a good source of molybdenum. I know it's a weird word, but this molybdenum is really important in enzymatic processes of the body. Remember, we're all biochemistry, so you wanna keep the engine running. It's good with manganese, it has the fiber, selenium, copper, that vitamin B1, that thiamine I told you about. It also has a good source of chromium. Now, what is chromium? Chromium is needed by um, your glucose transport and your insulin. So this actually helps you to be more sensitive sensitive um, to your blood sugar. So if you do have diabetes, you want to make sure you get good chromium. And it's not something I'd want you to take as a supplement. So have barley. 
phosphorus, so that's good for our bones, the magnesium, the niacin. It's good for the intestinal health, of course, because of the fiber. It slows the progression of atherosclerosis. Now that's a good thing too, because remember atherosclerosis is what clogs our arteries, mainly the coronary arteries. And if you clog your coronary arteries, that's a uh, prime for a heart attack, right? It does lower the risk of diabetes. And this was interesting. I read a study that it shows that it protects against postmenopausal breast cancer and it reduces the symptoms of rheumatoid arthritis. I would have to see the actual mechanism of how it does that. And then this just shows you the fiber content. Um, more the better. That's what I say. So one cup of barley, 13.6. Imagine that. If I have two cups of barley, I already met my fiber intake needs for the day. Isn't that great? So it's nice, high in fiber. So again, just rinse it. Um, this I definitely add more water to. So I do three parts, <laughs> three or three and a half. Um, you can boil it and do it the hard way, but get a rice cooker. <laughs> The other way that I like barley is you can make, uh, you can mix it with other flours as well. So you can buy the flour. Um, there are barley flakes. So that's nice. That's a nice substitution to, uh, for your cereal. Um, you can make it again in soups. You can do it as a side dish. You can, you know, use it for breakfast. Um, you can use, mix it with rice. If you're going to do a rice peel off, that's always nice. And this is a really fun recipe here for the Mediterranean roasted vegetable and barley. Um, so you might want to download that. That's a good recipe. And I just wanted to mention this. This is just such a childhood memory for me because my mother used to drink this all the time and she would buy this barley tea and it's not really a tea per se. It's barley that's been roasted and it, it, it's like this, it comes, you know, it looks like barley. And then what she would do is she would um, boil the water and let it simmer in that water. And it looks like this. And it's got a very unique taste. It's earthy, it's roasted, it's, it's really very, very nice. And um, we Koreans believe that it helps everything. So it's gonna help your stomach ache, it's gonna help you to sleep better. If you have constipation, it's gonna help that. <laughs> if you have prostate issues, it's gonna help that. It'll cure the common cold. Old. It'll even help prevent tooth decay, <clears throat> but you might want to try it. You can actually get it um, in Asian markets and it's very easy. You just boil water, stick it in there and let it seep and then you can make it as strong as you want. <laughs> The other one I wanted to talk about is rye. Now rye is really nice. I mean, you know, we're familiar with rye bread and rye crackers. Um, rye is the key ingredient in pumpernickel bread. Um, it is one of the most recently domesticated cereal crops that I didn't know. It was first grown in Germany. Um, rye is thought to have originated from a wild species. That's interesting. Rye is, is really, um, I think, a forgotten grain. It really is. Um, it's got a good source of manganese and the fiber and the phosphorus, but also pantothenic acid. Pantothenic acid is used in the Krebs cycle. It's used in all these biochemistry cycles of our body, so we need it. And it also contains lignin, which is a phytonutrient. And look at it again, it has a very high fiber content, which is nice. A third of a cup has over eight grams of fiber. That's really good. So again, the higher the fiber, the better it is for your heart health, your GI health, your blood sugar health, it helps to reduce cancer. It may be protective against childhood asthma, but I wouldn't know the uh, mechanism to that. That's interesting. Helps to reduce symptoms of menopause. And of course it helps to reduce weight, right? If you feel full, you don't eat as much. So what's nice about rye is it's not just found in crackers and bread. You can actually get the flour and then you can use the flour to make, you know, if you like to make bread or if you like to make pancakes or waffles or things like that, that would be nice. Um, they come in flakes. So again, you can substitute that for your, you know, corn flakes. And I really love this website. This is um, a small farm here in the United States. Uh, um, you might want to check them out because they have some really nice organic GMO free grains. Um, and they do have rye. And it's a really um, interesting story on how this farm got started. So you might want to take a look at that website. 
And then last but not least, in honor of my bird, we've got to talk about millet. <laughs> so I have a parrot and he eats millet all the time, but it's not just for birds, but this is definitely a grain that is really forgotten in the American diet. It's more common if you look at recipes from Africa and Morocco and places like that. Um, millet actually isn't a grain per se, it's actually considered a seed. It is gluten-free. Um, they do make breads out of them. You can make it like a side dish. You can use this, you know, in substitution for um, uh, oatmeal and things like that. They have different colors. That's what's so nice about millet too. You know, my bird is eating this one, but I like, kind of like this golden one. Millet, again, is so good for our blood because it's got copper, it's got the manganese, it's good for our blood pressure because the magnesium, it's good for our bones because of the phosphorus. So again, it's going to help our, our heart, it's going to help prevent diabetes. This is neat too, it helps to repair body tissues and that's because of the manganese. Manganese helps to do that. Helps to prevent against, uh, prevent against cancer, prevents gallstones because it helps to decrease some of the bile acids that go through our gallbladder. Um, cook it again the way you would rice. You can cook it, you know, and have it in as a side dish. Um, the way that I've made this is I almost make it kind of like, again, kind of like my farro. I have like the same recipes and then I just change my grains just to play around with it. I've used it as a breakfast. So like oatmeal, I've done that. Um, I've gotten uh, some millet flour to make breads and muffins because I like to cook, so I make bread. Um, but I also like to cut vegetables in it because I put vegetables in everything. So I use it as a side dish, kind of like couscous. I use it as a couscous alternative. Um, again, try to do uh, two and a half parts. Again, so it, it does require a little extra water again. And this is a really nice recipe for the summer millet salad. I mean, look how amazingly good this hat looks. It's got the tomatoes, it has scallions, it has uh, parsley, it has some cheese in it. Uh, it just looks so good. So really, I think the take home message of this lecture is if we're going to follow a low carb diet and we have to be really picky what we add in in terms of our carb, try to be adventurous and go for the unique grains that you wouldn't typically go for. Don't be afraid of it. Hey, the worst thing that can happen is you'll burn it, right? Or it'll be too dry or too chewy. You just, you know, and that's just part of cooking. You'll just have fun with it. Like, you know, my popcorn that I burnt. So what? I'm going to try it again. And again, if you have a rice cooker or if you have, you know, one of those those, um, uh, what do you call those crock pots? I mean, it just, it's so easy to cook with that. One trick is always rinse it with cold water. The other trick is if it's a whole grain, especially farro, you want to soak it. And that's for almost all grains that are whole grain. If you can soak it, it speeds up that cooking process. If you're following a gluten-free diet, these are some really nice choices because corn and rice gets very boring after a while. And just be really adventurous with it. Just add anything to it. A lot of these grains don't have very overpowering tastes. So it's going to take on the flavors of whatever you want it to taste like. All right, well, I hope you enjoyed the grain lecture. <laughs> Are there any questions? Anything in the chat? I don't see anything in the chat, but any questions? Um, that was great, I Lillian, thank you. You're welcome, that was fun. I have a question about taste of these grains. Yeah. Um, I, I know quinoa and I fix that fairly frequently. My husband doesn't like it, but mm -hmm. since I've been cooking it in um, the, uh, Chicken stock. Yes. She likes it or beef stock. So yes. that's what I do. I would do the same thing to some of these other grains, like especially millet, because millet is kind of boring um, in terms of flavor. You really need to jazz it up. Or, but even frica, barley, whenever you, whatever liquid that you add to it will always spice it up a little bit because, you know, water is kind of bland. So you can cook any of these in broth. Go for it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Good question. What else? So now everybody's going to be all excited to go out and get some of these whole grains. I can tell. <laughs> I'll try it. I'll try a couple of them. Yeah. Um, as I say, quinoa is the one I've, I've always used. The other ones I didn't know much about. Mm -hmm. Well, cook it the same way. Because you know how to cook your quinoa, you're going to know how to cook these. It's the same way. Um, you might just have to play around with your liquid just to see what kind of consistency you have. Quinoa is interesting because when you eat it, it almost has like, almost pops 
in your mouth, you know? Yeah. Yep. Um, where millet is kind of like that. Amaranth is kind of like that. But farro is more like, tastes like barley a little bit, you know, that kind of consistency. So they all have different consistencies. Some of them are chewy, you know, but they're all very pleasant. And again, look at the heart, uh, the health benefits you get from all these things. Yes. Yes. Good job, you guys. Thank you so much for coming today. It's just so fun to talk to you guys. I know sometimes I ramble on and on because, you know, I can't interact directly with you. So I feel like I'm just talking to myself. But thank you so much. I know you're listening and, and thank you for appreciating it. And it's a lot of fun. And next month, I think we're going to talk about what foods can help lower your cholesterol. I think that's really interesting, too. So hopefully you'll join in on that one. Thank All you very right, much. Guys. Thanks, You're welcome. Lillian. Thanks, you guys. Have a good day. Be safe and well. I'll see you, you soon. Too. Thank you. Bye-bye.